Hello everyone, once again, hope you've been enjoying the great day of content thus far and for stage one, you're in for a special pre-Christmas treat. For, for our penultimate session, we'll be hearing from Design's Executive Vice President, Joe Mikowski, who'll be delving into the strategies behind the global launch, which launched over 200 countries yesterday, and how the global strategy relates to its local approaches. So it should be a good one, this. Again, we hope you'll get involved in the conversation, so please do send in your questions um, where Hannah will be allocating accordingly. Uh, not to take up any more time, happy to hand things over to your moderator, uh, Chief Strategy and Business Development Officer at Formula E. We're calling in from um, Hammersmith, Hannah Brown. So Hannah will lead this conversation with Joe, so please do enjoy it, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, well, hello and good afternoon for those of you that are in Europe and whatever time it is for those of you joining us from all around the world. Um, Joe and I were laughing that this is becoming a bit of a regular thing, um, the Joe and I stand up. Um, and I think last time, Joe, we did this, we were in Atlanta, um, which feels like a very, very long time ago now. Um, so, Joe, great to see you. Um, I understand you're in New York, is that right? I'm in New York, yeah, it's good to be speaking with you. Um, wish we were doing it in person, but we've done a few of these in person. Hopefully they go as well as they have done uh, uh, online. But yeah, good to be speaking to everyone and, and, and happy to be here uh, uh, talking about our global launch. Um, great, well look, pleasure pleasure to have you, Joe. And um, look, conscious that we've got 40 minutes for this session, um, I've got lots of things that I want to ask you about and hopefully, um, given all that's been going on over the last kind of six, seven months since we last spoke, there's a lot to update people on, um, not least the the um, you know the big announcement that you guys had yesterday. Um, but also, it would be great to hear all of your questions. So I've got swap card here. Hopefully, um, all will work smoothly, and I will keep an eye on the questions and make sure um, that we leave plenty of time for the questions that you have. So, Joe, probably before we get into the launch, um, what has been a long build up to this global launch for DAZN? Um, but we all know how tough the last seven months have been. Um, there's been big restructures in media companies and all sorts of other organizations around the world. The zone, you know, I know has done a lot of you know, deep thinking about what the long term strategy is and using your role. I think last time we met, you were EVP for North America and your new title is EVP Global Platform and Renov Revenue Innovation at the DAZN mm -hmm. Group. So do you want to give people a bit of background on the evolution that DAZN has been on over the last kind of six, seven months. And, and probably I think that will tie us in nicely to um, the announcement that you guys have just made. Yeah, obviously I think for everyone on this call, everyone dialing in, it's obviously been a tough year. If you make your business in sport, you need sports events to be uh, happening and uh, fans to be engaging in those sports events to have a, a normal run of business. That obviously hasn't been what's happened this year. Um, We've been on a journey in the last six, seven months, as I'm sure every business represented on this call has been on. So I think, first of all, react to what happened. Obviously, it was a complete shock and something no one could see coming. And then I think we went through a period of um, strategic reflection, if that's the right phrase, to sort of review uh, structurally how we were set up, um, uh, where we were heading from a, from a, from a key market and, and new product launch perspective, and then sort of last couple of months going to a sort of executional phase once that was settled. So. In each of those three phases, um, with the challenges of being a global business anyway, the additional sort of um, injection of remote working and um, a disparate workforce all around the world, uh, I've been impressed by how we've pulled together. It's, been, it's not been easy. Um, there's been a number of changes that we've had to adapt to. There's been a changing environment outside of the four walls of the company. Um, but I think where we land at the end of the year, obviously yesterday's announcement being one sort of relatively sort of aggressive growth, uh, plan that we're putting into effect. Um, I think we, we're ending the year in, in a really good position, arguably in a better position than we went into COVID with in the first place at the back end of Q1. So um, we're happy with where we've landed and we're, we're very excited to be on the front foot um, launching globally and making ourselves available to, to everyone in this call rather than just those in eight or nine markets as we were a few months ago. So um, yeah, exciting times after a, a very tough six, seven months of hard work. Yeah. I mean, we know that across the board, there's been lots of media rights renegotiations, I think, through every single um, organization that licenses media rights and DAZN is, is clearly one of those. We won't go into the clearly the details and the broader business, but I do think it's worth um, giving everyone a bit of an update on DAZN's core nine markets, which, if my list is correct here, we've got Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Spain, Canada, Italy, the US, Japan, and to name not, not the last, Brazil. Um, mm. 
the launch of the DAZN global business is to touch upon those markets outside of those core nine. Um, but as we, as you were thinking about your rights strategy on a global basis, give us a bit of background about how your rights buying in the US, obviously particularly in boxing, was something where you thought, well, this is something we would like to translate to a global basis and see if we can take this out into, into more markets. Yeah, I mean, the major headline for us in, in the initial content offer we're putting out into the market with the global platform is that we're effectively leveraging an existing investment net out of the US. Over the last two or three years, there's some exceptions and there's nuances to it, of course, always, but we've owned the majority of our boxing content primarily acquired for the US on a global scale. And we've been trading that content to our friends in the broadcast community globally, fight by fight or fight season by fight season. Um, what we're doing with this global launch is effectively taking that content back in house and using it as the the content vehicle to fuel the launch of the of the global platform. I think a a common misconception about our business, especially amongst consumers in the UK, who obviously hear a lot of Eddie Hearn's noise making, uh, that we are a boxing business. Um, yes, we have a major investment in 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 US boxing that will translate in the first phase to being our core content with the global platform. But longer term, is our, our ambition with uh, the global platform in specific markets, new markets, will be to become a multi-sport broadcaster like we are in, in the vast majority of those nine countries you listed. So um, from an from a operational perspective, a technical perspective, a commercial and partnerships perspective, boxing content we own and, and the investment we made in our platform now on a global scale acts as a sort of architectural platform from which we can you know, build from in individual markets where opportunities make sense. So. Uh, boxing, obviously leveraging that existing investment to get us to that point. But going forward, we'll be able to consider our investment strategy, our, our rights investment strategy on a truly global basis in those nine countries and outside of them uh, as we scale yeah. the business. So it sort of it, it puts us in a, in a nice position to consider opportunities of all different shapes and sizes in all corners of the world and use our capital as effectively as possible. So it's strategically quite, quite significant. Okay, and it's interesting actually because I've had a couple of questions come in here already. So one was, what was the most challenging market to enter so far? And and I think linked to that is what are the main strategies you consider when choosing a new market? And you know, we've discussed between us a bit before um, about the challenges of the US were very different to some of the challenges you had in Europe and, and potentially even in a market like Japan. Um, mm. And I want to come on a little bit to the kind of product distribution plan where you know, clearly in your core nine markets so far, especially in some of your big European markets, you have now expanded from a straight direct to consumer model to also a distributor model through other major platforms. Could you yeah. just address that question around the toughness to enter a market and maybe entering a market is one thing, but thinking about what your strategy is for growth in that particular market is something we've watched as own evolve kind of live in real time over the last two or three years. Yeah, well, there's a lot there. So let, let me let me deal with the first bit first. That market entry is there are some consistencies, of course, there's operational readiness, there's technical stability. Many people on this call uh, will recognize that delivering HD quality live broadcast on mass with high volumes of content uh, with, you know, uh, sophisticated production operations around it is, is a very hard operational task. Happy to say that our investment and our energies there have generally operationally touched wood, made our, our market entries uh, better and better and more and more effective. And that's uh, reflected in a very smooth day yesterday. Um, the actual specifics commercially and, and once you're up and running operationally in a, in a, in a market are, are very, very different. I was lucky enough to lead the Japanese business for two years from prior to launch all the way through to the start of 2018. And then came to the US to, to, to take on the, the US launch. Two entirely different markets with entirely different but equally challenging sort of um, uh, things to get through when you first step in. In Japan, obviously, you're a Western business. You've got uh, a, a, an unknown Western brand taking huge, uh, huge investment of, of domestic content. No one knew who we were. Uh, doing business in Japan is very, very different to doing business in Western Europe and the States. Uh, you've got the challenge of language, you've got the challenge of the sort of cultural consumption of content cultural uh, consumption of marketing is very, very different. I think those would be, uh, you know, cultural factors continue to be major, major things to step through in Japan. We're getting much better at it and our brand uh, is cutting through more and more in Japan uh, month on month. In the US, entirely different kettle of fish, not so much cultural challenges, not so much language challenges, obviously, for a British business, but definitely the sort of size of task taking on the likes of 
uh, ESPN, the established legacy media companies, in some cases competing for rights, competing for airtime. The thing that struck me in the US most notably was the amount of noise there is in the market. You're not just talking about boxing competition. You're talking about other sports. You're talking about a crowded calendar. You're talking about entertainment noise, just general cultural noise in the US is so hard to cut through. It's such a huge country with so many platforms you could reach consumers by. How you use your marketing budget most effectively to make as much noise and establish your brand as possible, especially with, let's be honest, boxing is, a, is, is not a top tier sport in the US. It's, it's not an NFL or an NBA. Uh, so trying to establish our brand, I think we did a, a good job there. We, 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 we played in traditional spaces. We advertise on Sunday night football. We also put into effect some, some relatively nuanced um, sort of um, alternative marketing strategies, the headline being KSI Logan Paul 2, which we obviously spoke about at length in Atlanta, which continues to be the most fun I've ever had at work. Um, but I think market by market, obviously the challenges are very, very different. So we know that we, we are obviously launching this global platform, but we recognize that our future growth is going to be led by markets. That's how content's traded. That's how fans ultimately consume content sport is a local business so that, that the way the reason we're referring to it as a platform we're referring to it as an architectural framework from which to build is because we know we're not going to build a homogenous global uh, service in in the first instance we're going to be making a, a a platform available from which we can grow local markets and invest in local markets and those challenges in those markets will be different we'll consider them on a case by case we'll put teams into those markets where it makes sense to do that uh, but our future growth will be, will be, for all those reasons, shaped by, by markets and not a homogenous global uh, growth strategy because it's just not how the sports consumer behaves or wants to be fed content. So um, that, right. that's, for me, the major consideration. Yeah. And it's interesting because plenty of questions are coming in here, as you can imagine, as to, well, which market is next, next most interesting to you? And um, it'd be good to get your um, perspective on when you went for this Right, low cost entry using effectively rights that in one way, shape or form you'd acquired already or you could expand in, yeah. onto a kind of global stage without it being too difficult to do. We all know how hard that is to take that global approach on buying sports rights. Not only is it whatever you want to buy, if it's meaningful, is phenomenally expensive to do that. But as you say, that localization of content delivery, but also that marketing strategy is incredibly different, whether you're marketing you know, football in the UK or you know motor gp in italy like you've just got such a different strategy about how you reach and engage with that customer so do you want to explain to people a little bit around that early um response that you got from some markets with your global launch of the brand and you thought well these markets might be interesting because there seems to be a predisposition for them to engage in the zone and explain a bit around the kind of test and learn approach that you're taking because i think for some people they're going to read this and think goodness me, DAZN thinks they're taking on all sports broadcasters with a mobile app and a website in all markets. And I, I don't get the impression from our conversations that that is, um, mm. that is the first part of the strategy, that this is a test and learn about how these global markets respond and where you think um, the DAZN brand is ready and then potentially financially able to compete with, with local yeah. rights. Yeah, we're not, we're not that cocky. Um, I, think, I think the... Um, well, first thing to say is that the, the the language thing, I think, first of all, making the platform available in English language globally first is reflective of where we expect to see significant demand. Um, we've made a lot of noise through our boxing investment in markets like the UK, in markets like Australia, where there is an established, um, very um, uh, well-educated and passionate boxing fan base. I think we're massively helped by the fact that one of our major promotional partners, Eddie, is based in the UK. I think a lot of the uh, people on this school's first interaction with the zone uh, as consumers would have been seeing us producing boxing content and seeing that talked about in the UK. I, I've been shaping where we're going to put most of our marketing attention initially and where we expect to put most of our marketing dollars to work uh, in, in the right. first phase is shaped by the, the volume of, 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 of consumers who've expressed demand to us in, through different platforms uh, saying, please bring the zone to my, to my country. You've had a landing page. If you hit zone.com three weeks ago, four weeks ago, or a year ago in the UK or in Australia or in India or in South Africa, you would have seen a, a message saying, we're not yet live in your country, but please give us your information and we'll, we'll, we'll let you know when we're going to launch in your country. You've had a phenomenally large number of people sign up to effectively what is a, a newsletter. We've converted that in the last six months into a beta testing community. So people have been invited to test the service and the, and the demand from 
boxing heavy markets uh, reflects the fact that um, most of our consumer sort of demand is being driven in, uh, by that sort of investment in boxing content. That makes us confident stepping into a global platform with boxing at the heart of it. Uh, it means we're going to spend the majority of our uh, of our uh, initial marketing dollars going after those hardcore boxing fans, or a lot of them globally. But ultimately, and I keep saying this to our team, is we've got to expect to be surprised. Uh, we've got dashboards now that we're going to watch with interest. I watch it all day. Uh, most days I'll have it on in the background, seeing where, where, what's going on in India, what's going on in Outer Mongolia, what's going on in Argentina. You, you'll be able to step back and go, right, actually, we didn't expect market A, B, or C to be that, to be that um, uh, interested in early, but the, the data is sort of overperforming there. We're being, we're being um, made aware of a base of consumers perhaps you weren't aware of previously. That sort of thing, coupled with, uh, opportunities brought to us by by content owners and by distribution partners in those markets are going to uh, marry up to, to make a market interesting and where all those things combine to make a business plan that makes economic sense for our board and our investors that's going to shape our future investment strategy so the beauty of this is we're going to have a completely global perspective any rights holder watching this is going to want to talk to us at some point about their their, their rights being traded in, in the next cycles in any market where we're going to be competitive and interested in talking about those opportunities when, when the content opportunity, the distribution opportunity, and ultimately the consumer demand marry up to make a, an appealing sort of P&L forecast, that's going to shape our, 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 our investment. That's obviously a massive difference to stepping in with market research data you've pulled off the shelf or, or uh, sort of uh, forecasting you're doing with some level of uh, blindness on, on actual operational uh, capability or execution. So that injection of data, real life operations is going to make our investment going forward, I think, more, more solid and to make our forecasting more solid and to make us make better decisions with our capital. So it's a major strategic pillar of our global launch uh, that we'll be able to do that. And it's, it's very exciting for us and our board as a result. Yeah. How do you get comfortable with your investment choices though? Because it's interesting your price point, right? 199 at your purposefully from what it looks like making the barrier to entry that you know, if I want to in January come and watch Garcia, Luke Campbell fight, it's an easy decision for me to make that, you know, I might think, okay, I don't have a smart TV, I can't, you know, I don't have an Apple TV, I can't Chromecast this to my big screen, I'm gonna watch it on my mobile, but for 199, I probably don't mind that that's my user experience. Um, but in, from your perspective, when you're, we all, you know, everyone works in an organization, you've got to fight for budget, you are gonna have some expectations and some allocation of that marketing spend. And given the content suite that you have got and the price point that you're charging, at what point do you go, you know, this is offsetting, I'm assuming that this new bit of my business has got a kind of nil rights cost because I'm absorbing that cost elsewhere. And maybe you could give us a bit of background where you have actually acquired specific rights for this platform. But I think largely it all kind of works off the yeah, yeah. broader deal that you've done in other markets. But at some stage yeah. you've got to go, okay, I now am prepared to make that next step and actually invest properly in a market yeah. where I have to go and persuade a rights holder that we can be, not only pay the rights fee that's interesting, but also have a distribution strategy and an audience strategy that underpins it because with sport, all rights holders want to know how many people are fundamentally going to watch my content along with how much you're going to pay me for it. Yeah. Well, you're right to say that the pricing being as low as it is, and it's for those who don't know, it's £1.99 or the equivalent uh, in, in all markets of the world. So in Eurozone markets, one euro ninety nine is an example. The pricing there is exactly as you say, to remove any real sort of paywall barrier. It's, it's priced for volume because we see huge values, I've mentioned, in acquiring as much data and consumer insight from the markets we're stepping into now as possible because the more we have, the more we know about consumer behavior, the more we know about demand for our service and comfort with OTT, and the more that we can be comfortable in, as we make future investment decisions. I think. Generally, obviously, we'll continue to monitor pricing. Uh, we'll, we'll look at demand. We'll look at sort of churn metrics with all of our KPIs to shape our sort of general pricing approach. But philosophically, it's going to be focused on being priced for volume until such a time that a market stands out on a standalone basis as, as being worth investing in more deeply. So as I say, when a content opportunity is brought to us, where a distribution, a, part, a set of distribution partners are available for us to, to work with and where there is adequate consumer demand for content, we're going to invest in those and sort of supersize the term we're using, the markets that we want to step into. So I'm not going to name a market because I don't want people to start thinking we're, we're ready to launch in a specific market because we're not. Um, but to say, um, if, if, if market X, we have a content opportunity from a domestic rights partner, 
Uh, we, we see opportunities to bundle international content or other lower lower tier domestic content around that. We know that we can get a deal with a telco. We can uh, place our, ourselves onto the onto the local distribution platforms that we're not already on globally. Um, and we know there's consumer demand. We'll say right, the, the plan now in this in, in market uh, A is to raise the price to insert number here, four ninety nine, nine ninety nine, fourteen ninety nine, whatever it is. Make that content available. Put boots on the ground prepare a, a sort of bespoke marketing plan and marketing budget for that for that country and, and, and go forward in a similar way to how we're operating in the, the eight or nine markets we're, we're already in um, on a standalone basis. So as, as I say, it's a platform that allows us to welcome opportunities, uh, cons assess consumer demand, and then guide individual market investment strategies going forward. Um, and that, I think, sort of Allow, sort of like an allotment to prepare to prepare uh, markets for readiness and when they're ready we, we put them out on a standalone basis and uh, and sort of manage them as a standalone business at that point yeah and given you're i'm sure going to have to run this on a relatively efficient marketing budget how are you handling those piece of content which we don't have on a multi-territory basis so look at the joshua fight for example which is excluded out of the uk um, how are you going to, are you just going to do that through very specific targeting? Or have you got some other strategies in mind so you don't confuse fans about what they can expect on, on the platform versus what, what, what won't be there? Well, the beautiful thing about boxing is that you need everyone involved in the event, the fighter, the promoter, the broadcaster in any market needs to make lots of noise about it. And, and there's for the right fights, you can, you can quite quickly earn quite a lot of coverage. Um, we also know there are, um, uh, very efficient sort of DR marketing tactics we can put into work. We're pretty well established now in an in, in efficient sort of CPA capture of, of of consumers across the you know the Facebook and Google networks and other digital platforms online, uh, and then obviously in individual markets using our, our comms team to really dial into the to the, the right places with with media and, and in, in the first instance boxing focused media uh, to reach consumers. I think we we recognise based on the demand we've seen and. Uh, the spread of that demand internationally, there's probably very low hanging fruit of, of hardcore boxing fans. Um, people who signed up yesterday, I know you did, Hannah, which we appreciate, but there are sort of more hardcore boxing fans than you who have signed up and starting to sign up this week in, in relatively good numbers. Obviously, we'll see that accelerate in the next few weeks with um, with uh, the, the schedule of fights we've got coming up. Um, but I think in the first instance, it's making sure we efficiently reach those people with the messaging. Uh, we use our social media channels. We use the social media channels of Anthony Joshua, of Canelo Alvarez, of Ryan Garcia. Collectively, that reach into that hardcore boxing fan base gives us channels to reach people repetitively and get the message across. And we back that up with, a, with an efficient sort of budget allocation for DR capture. So when Hannah Brown in South Africa or Australia Googles Anthony Joshua, where can I watch tonight? We are efficiently capturing that demand and converting it into a subscription. So uh, all things considered, rights and marketing budget, you're right to say it's, 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 it's leveraging of our existing investments and our existing uh, learnings and relationships. Um, it, it means that we are going to be very efficient, I think, in one, launching this thing, which we have been, and two, yeah. um, capturing demand globally. Longer term, rights and opportunities dependent will we'll obviously increase that investment in specific markets but on a global basis initially with this boxing slate of contents uh, i'm very confident it's going to be a pretty efficient business and it's interesting because there's been a question here around language and and english being a limitation you know i know we discussed a bit about where you've seen early traction those english language markets clearly made sense although you could argue it's self-selecting when you talk in english you attract an english language audience and you stay on that yeah. same circle but actually, what's interesting about the zone, and I remember having this conversation back in the days when you were performed before you even started, was you know Hispanic fighters in America was the was the um, you know was the opening entry about rights that the perform group then felt that they could buy that weren't tied up in you know these U.S. media deals that can be you know anything between eight and ten or twelve years long. Um, there's an ability to enter the U.S. market. And you know, even when we look at the stable of fighters that you've got coming up over the next six to eight weeks, you know, there's a there's a strong Spanish representation in there. So talk us through why not Spanish, and is that to do with content and demand, or is it to do with propensity to pay or device penetration? Yeah. Like, what is it that made you go, we're just going to stick to English language only um, to start off with? I'll touch upon the length of US legacy media deals first. Constantly have John Skipper apologising internally for stitching himself up inadvertently by doing these long deals when he was at ESPN and now it's his own. He, he can't crack in and get access to the content. So that's always a, a laugh when he does that. 
Um, but I think English language, look, we're going to test and learn on this. We, we produce a Spanish feed for our um, Mexican American and, and Hispanic audience in the US already. We'll make that available on the global platform. So where we are producing a, a Spanish commentary and a, and a Spanish feed around a Canelo event, for example, or a, 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 a Ryan Garcia event, we'll make that available on the platform for those in Spanish speaking markets. The environment will be English, but the commentary and presentation of that event will be in Spanish. We'll also test and learn with uh, other markets as well. So we've got AJ Pulev coming up. Uh, Pulev is Bulgarian, a significant Bulgarian following. Uh, we're stepping through various uh, COVID-related challenges and getting Bulgarian commentators into one of our commentary facilities in Europe. Uh, we'll do the same with uh, Triple G against Sarah's Meta the following weekend on the 18th of, of, of December with um, with a Polish audience. So we're going to test and learn. We're going to look at that. Uh, I think the, the general strategy is, is leverage the English language platform we've built. Um, you know, the techies on the line will appreciate that building a French or uh, in an extreme case an, an Arabic or a, or a different alphabet platform is significant. We don't want to lumber ourselves with significant costs until we know there's an opportunity uh, to recoup on that investment. So we won't do that in any depth until we have opportunities that, that, that demand it. But we will test and learn, I think, with content presentation and commentary uh, where, where the fights and where the schedule makes sense. So um, we're, we're very happy to be testing and learning. We're going to be working with commentators and, and, and sort of um, pundits in various different countries of the world as the schedule brings in people from all corners. Um, but I think at, at our heart, initially, it's about leveraging that platform and, and that platform obviously being English language makes the most sense globally. Yeah. And I should probably know the answer to this, but in some of those markets, you are all, you are therefore going to be the domestic broadcast. You're obviously not the domestic broadcaster for the Joshua fight, but for most of those fights, you will be the main domestic broadcaster. Is, is, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, we'll be, yes, most of those events will happen in the United States, but we'll be broadcasting into the domestic markets. Sorry, I meant the market. domestic, yeah, the market. Of yeah, the for like, for, 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 and up until now, fighters have had carve-outs on their, on their fights. So a Polish fighter fighting Gennady Golovkin traditionally would have retained Polish media rights. We're politely saying, well, that's no longer on the table for discussion because we're going to be broadcasting that in Poland exclusively. The same is true in Bulgaria. Uh, the same is true, for example, with Luke Campbell fighting an American, but in the UK, we carry that content exclusively now. So uh, that's a bit of a tweak to the, to the way of working. But again, it allows us to incrementally add you know, little pockets of subscribers who, who, who want to consume in their domestic markets, their fighters take on these, these international challenges. And it's all going to add up and allow us to reach a, a bigger and bigger base of consumers month on month. Yeah. And it's interesting because obviously whilst the investment in the US market has been big, DAZN is still in the great scheme of US broadcasters, you know, one of the smaller ones given, you know, as you alluded to, the tie up of the big US rights with, with the major media with the major media properties. Um, but it's interesting when you look to Europe and after your standalone entry first, you know, pursuing this distributed platform approach um, and to make that clear for people listening in, you know, the idea that you don't just go to the DAZN destination, whether it's on mobile or a connected TV app, but you've also got a linear distribution through um, major cable or satellite um, kind of incumbents in those markets. There's, there's questions coming in here about, you know, they're using boxing as an example, but do you see yourself taking on Sky in the UK, for example, specifically around boxing rights? But I think it's probably just worth clarifying a bit about this approach around testing and learning with this entry mm. with a long tail of boxing on, across that say, you know, these 200 markets, and then that triggering a response to invest properly in a market where probably your distribution strategy will become a bit more traditional and formal so you can satisfy those requirements yeah. of rights holders. Do you want to explain that in a little bit more detail? It's, it's, it's less so about rights holders, although it always, you know, working with our rights holders to satisfy their needs. For, for us and for me, I think we've philosophically been on a bit of a journey with this with this whole distribution thing over the last five years. If you'd asked me or James Rushton or John Gleisier five years ago, are we going to make linear channels for design? The answer would have been, why would we do that? No, we're disrupting linear broadcasting. We don't want to do that. No. Um, have we completely flipped on that? Of course not. Our core distribution, our growth, um, it's going to be OTT. The trends that are already moving towards that as a, as a larger and larger share of, of content consumption have been dramatically accelerated in all major media markets by COVID. That, that's a well-reported thing in, in our industry and in the entertainment industry more generally. But I do think philosophically we, we've stepped back and it's one of the things we've reflected on this year as well is who are we to not allow a consumer who doesn't want to use OTT access to his or her content? You know. Um, the boxing audience is it spreads through all demographics, it spreads through all age categories. 
Um, I know for a fact that if my grandfather was still around, he was a boxing fan. He wouldn't have wanted to use in his 80s or 90s an OTT service. He would have completely confused me from a generation that you had just about worked out how to use Sky Plus, sat in Somerset in his house, right? So we don't want to restrict him from accessing our content because it's not what we're philosophically about. We're about bringing content to sports fans in a, you know, in a, in a democratic way and maximizing the audience that, that watch sports content. Uh, that's at the core of what we're doing, the heart of why we exist as a business. So we sort of stepped back and thought, well, if there are if there are a pocket of subscribers in every market, and we experienced it in Canada, we've experienced it in Italy, we've experienced it in, in Germany, we want to consume content on a linear channel, they are never going to buy an OTT subscription for whatever reason. And generally it skews older. It's not necessarily exclusively older people, but it but it generally does because my parents' generation and our generation Hannah are generally comfortable with OTT. We we do not believe we should be a blocker to that and by exclusively broadcasting on on uh, an OTT platform. So whilst we will continue to invest in being on every single connected device in your household or in your pocket or in your laptop or on your work computer screen or on your smart television, um, we, we made the decision to effectively green light linear distribution where it makes sense. And it also acts to be the lever to partner with established distribution networks who, who can give us benefit beyond just reaching the consumer in a, in a broader set of ways. So it does open conversations with the likes of the, the major uh, domestic um, pay TV platforms. It opens it opens conversations with the likes of Sky in the UK longer term. Um, but if for us, at, at the very heart of it, philosophically, it's about making sure that we are reaching consumers everywhere they want to consume sport and not leaving anyone out of the party. Um, and I think that's the right strategic decision for our business. Obviously, the economics of the deal and, and, and the specifics of how we trade and operate with those, with those partners uh, needs to be thought about and it will be bespoke on a, on a case by case. But our distribution teams are clear that that shouldn't be a distribution channel they should turn off if it makes sense we'll we'll look to we'll look to do it yeah i think it's interesting because you know it's funny having come from the us market and the connected tv is so prevalent and it's such a mature market from a connected you know tv perspective i mean i was blown away when i found out there were 250 million connected tvs you know in the united states mm. which is an incredibly huge number when you think about 120 million homes um, but Europe, even so, is a long way behind that, and the rest of the world is an awfully long way behind that too. And we all know how frustrating it is in the home, even here in the UK, if you're having to flip between various interfaces to find the content you want. So you know that makes I, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. But when you're yeah, looking, it's about, it's about, it's about democratizing. One of our internal statements is about democratization of sport, making sport more accessible and more affordable and more flexible. Uh, it, it, it's inconsistent. It would be inconsistent of us to turn off channels that or platforms that people want to use to watch it. So yeah. whilst I think, and without you know, for t- to find a point on it, it's it's it, it's uh, you're not extracting value right from a you know people might talk yeah. about the future of TV, but. Um, you know, even when people talk time. about average yeah. audience for a, a program is 45 or 50 years old, like A, I'd like to think that's not actually that old anymore. And those people are still going to be with us for another 30 years, which will probably hopefully outlive my working career anyway. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I think, think well, it's all, it, you can, uh, uh, the trend will, the trend is accelerated this year. OTT is the platform of the future. We all know that. So that's why conferences like this exist and, and people like me and you are able to make livings in this space. Um, and look, the, 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 I'm noticing as we look step back and look at our consumption patterns globally, the percentage of total content consumption on big screens like the connected TV in my living room I've got to my left here, that's a bigger, bigger in sh- a share of our overall consumption. Um, people are getting more and more comfortable with the OTT experience in their, in their, in their smart TVs. There are more and more platforms that connect to smart TVs to allow that. The ecosystem within the environment is, is better and better. The user experience, I should say, is better and better. And that will just continue to, to, to grow. But in the short term, especially maybe even the medium term, as I say, who are we to, to stop people watching content? It helps our business. It helps fans um, reach their sport. And that is ultimately what, what we're about doing. So, um, yeah, it, it isn't, if you put it in those terms, it's a bit of a no-brainer. We should be doing it. Yeah. I'm conscious we've got four minutes left. Um, good question. Just coming here, just thinking about the next five years. So, DAZN over. How, so, how old is DAZN now? Four years? Four years old? Well, in terms of in terms of when a group of five of us got into a very unglamorous room in Feltham, I think that was six years ago this month. But in terms of a, a live broadcast operation, we we were summer twenty sixteen, so just over four years old. Um, which yeah. is yeah, feels a lot longer. A few more Same. bags under the eyes, but um it's definitely <laughs> been a, a wild ride for four or five years, yeah. Yeah, definitely has. So 
Four, so nine major markets now. We've got this global launch, which I think I'm right in summarizing as a test and learn in multiple markets. You decide where you want to next put your flag down. So the question of where will DAZN be in the next five years, much as I hate it when anyone asks me this question, um, what are your thoughts when you, know, when you and James and the team sit down and think about the next few years? What's top of the list? Uh, I think we'll be continuing to invest in growing our, you know, putting more flags in more countries, but the, the answer to which, which countries and which flags we plant is ultimately going to be shaped by what we learn in the next 12 to 18 months as we, as we scale our operations. The pipeline of, of incoming content and distribution opportunities is starting to grow. So our friends in the rights team, that the Ed Breezes and Matt Drews of the world are getting busy and busier inboxes, Yak and Botanoni getting uh, more and more uh, incoming from, from various corners of the world. Those opportunities shaped by the distribution opportunities, as I keep saying, will, will, will drive where we plant flags. So that sort of core market sort of expansion. I also think what the zone looks like as a consumer experience, what we offer to consumers will dramatically change as well. Up until now, again, the other side of my role on, on revenue innovation, we've actually only we've, we've touched upon very important segments of the sports fan experience, broadcasts of live content sort of social media conversations, working with athletes and rights holders. That's core to the sports fan experience. There's a whole load of other things we haven't even gone near that are core to the sports fan experience. What's the in-stadio experience like post-COVID? Um, what is the, uh, how do athletes reach their audiences longer term? What's the betting and gaming space going to look like as it relates to OTT broadcast? So uh, expanding and repositioning internally first and then to the consumer. What, what the zone is to the consumer? How many touch points within the sports fan experience? It touches upon is going to be really, really important. I think over, five, over a five-year time horizon, um, what the zone is in the world of sport to sports fans could dramatically change and deepen and expand, and that's the other side of my role, right? And we're relatively nascent in that. Um, there's definitely sort of board interest and senior management interest in evolving that quite quickly. So I think you'll see us uh, step into that in the course of 2021 and 2022. But when we get to 2025, it could be significant revenue streams being delivered by a completely different set of touch points we haven't even gone near thus far so that's really exciting because it's about repositioning and diversifying our business and, and deepening our touch points with consumers which is great yeah the good news is you gave a sufficiently long enough answer to that, that i don't have time to ask you what i did want to ask which is we all do things look back and we maybe regret them and we maybe there'll be some markets that disown um that disown yeah. maybe in hindsight thinks that it, it, it would be better giving a a wide berth to, but maybe we can save that till our till our next turn at this, maybe in six months' time. So, I, 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 I've got a, <laughs> yeah. So I've got um. So I, I've got a question from you, which is um, long leg or slip fielder. I'm going to caveat that as given you've been in the US for however long, and uh, with a little stint in France this summer, you probably haven't done much cricket fielding. But where do you play? We've had we've had the, we've had the, we had the England cricket rights on the zone USA all summer. So I was one of one of the uh, one of the most ardent consumers of the service during the summer. Um, no, I'm obviously a big, I'm a big cricket fan. I, mean, I, think, I think the ECB's output this summer was one of the best in, in the world of sports. So very appreciative of, of that as we sat in lockdown watching some high quality cricket. But um, yeah, I've got my, I've got my trusty grey nickels behind me here, which is a, a, a nice throwback to being, being back in the UK. Well, you haven't actually answered the question. Are you a long leg or a slip fielder? I was never a slip fielder. I was more. I, I sort of saw myself as, as a cover point man, but I think my uh, my hand eyes slightly deteriorated over the last few years. John Gleeshaw will be watching this and sort of scoffing to himself, making some wise crack about my cricketing abilities. But uh, golf is my focus now, and I'm not very good at that either. Quite right. Well, look, um, Joe, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for all the questions, um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Appreciate it.